Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the adenovalve cyclase protein kinase A pathway. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, I'm currently describing to you how the alpha subunit of heterotrimeric G proteins gets um, lipid moieties stuck onto the side of it, which are going to anchor themselves into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and therefore hold the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein attached to the underside of the cell membrane, basically. Okay, right. So we've seen s palmitoylation which is one of these uh, lipid modifications that can occur to add palmitoyl groups onto cysteine residues within the alpha subunits. Now, uh, most alpha subunits get one palmitoyl group added onto it. There is a little bit of growing evidence that certain alpha subunits actually get two palmitoyl groups added onto it, but it, that's still not certain. What is certain is that every single alpha subunit of heterotrimeric G proteins gets a palmitoyl group added onto one of its cysteine residues. Okay, and those cysteine residues, as far as I know, are not fully characterized yet, so we don't know exactly which one it is for all of the alpha subunits. Okay, right. So, um, let's now talk about the other lipid modification that occurs to some alpha subunits, okay? And this is called n myristoylation and this involves the addition of myristic acid molecules onto the alpha subunits. Okay, so we'll start off with what is myristic acid. Now, again, it's a nice, simple um, molecule because it's now called, this is again an old name, and you can't gain anything from just looking at the old name, whereas if we look at its new name, which tells us exactly what it is, its new name is tetradecanoic acid. Okay, and that tells us exactly what it is. Okay, that tells us it's almost identical, in fact, to palmitic acid. It tells us that we're dealing with a 14 carbon this time, fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, so let's just draw this. Uh, for the sake of having a picture. So here is our carboxylic acid group. Now we need 12 methylene groups this time, not 14. Okay, so here's one methylene group. I will do my trick again. I'll bracket it and subscript 12, and then we'll have the methyl group coming off the end, and that takes us up now to a total of 14 carbons, 12 in the middle, one on either side. That takes us up to 14. Okay, so this is myristic acid or tetradecanoic acid. Now, myristic acid molecules are not added onto cysteine residues like uh, palmitic acid molecules. Instead, they are added onto glycine residues that are at the um, N-terminal um, portion of the polypeptide. Okay, so let me explain this. So, basically, if we have a polypeptide here, okay, then the polypeptide has some amino terminus here, and then it has some carboxylic acid terminus here, okay? Um, now, the amino terminus is viewed as the start of the polypeptide, and the carboxylic acid terminus is viewed as the end of the polypeptide. Basically, Proteins can be n myristorylated if their first amino acid is a glycine. Okay, and the single letter amino acid code uh, for glycine is G. And basically, the myristic acid molecule is going to be added onto this free amino group that you will have on this first amino acid. Okay, but it only occurs if the first amino acid is a glycine. Now, you might be saying, hang on a moment. The first amino acid of proteins is absolutely always methionine, isn't it? Because that's the one that corresponds to the start codon. And I would say you're absolutely right. When proteins are first made, when they first come out of a ribosome, of course, their first amino acid will be methionine, absolutely always, because that's the one that's put in for the single start codon, uh, AUG. Okay? Um, however, Often proteins will have that first methionine cut off, okay? So they can end up with different amino acids as their first amino acids. Okay, so if your first amino acid is a glycine, then you can have uh, a myristic acid molecule stuck onto your uh, amino terminus. Okay, so let's draw this. 
So here is this free amino terminus, and this is why it can only happen for the first amino acid, because all the other amino acids are not going to have a free amino terminus, because the amino terminus will be involved in binding to the carboxylic acid terminus of the amino acid that went before it. Okay, so here is our glycine amino acid. Now, uh, what is the R group for glycine? What's well, the simplest proteinergic amino acid? You just have a single hydrogen there. Okay, so this is our glycine in position one. And basically what's going to happen is we're going to attach this carboxylic acid group of the meristic acid molecule onto this amino group of the glycine, which is the first amino acid in our polypeptide. Okay, and we're going to do this via an amide link. So, we're going to take off the alcohol group from the carboxylic acid group, we're going to take off the hydrogen from the amino group, or at least one of the hydrogens from the amino group. Uh, we're then going to bind this carbon of the carboxylic acid molecule to this nitrogen of the amino group, okay, and that link that we've got there, that will be called an amide link. Okay, and we have therefore added a meristic acid molecule onto our amino terminus. Now again, have we added the entire meristic acid molecule? Not quite. We haven't added the alcohol group. Okay, instead, we've added this group here. Okay, so the carboxylic acid group without the alcohol group of the carboxylic acid group. Now, there is a generic name for a carboxylic acid molecule without its alcohol group, and that's known as the acyl group of a carboxylic acid group. So, basically, we added on the acyl group of palmitic acid onto the cysteine residues. We added on the acyl group of our meristic acid molecules onto these amino terminal glycine uh, residues. Okay, now the specific name for the acyl group of palmitic acid was palmitoyl. The specific name for the acyl group of meristic acid is myristoyl. Okay, so this is a myristoyl group that we have added onto the uh, amino terminal domain, uh, well the amino terminus rather, of our polypeptide. Okay, so certain alpha subunits can also get a meristic acid molecule added on to the glycine that is at the first amino acid position of their uh, polypeptide. Okay, so at the moment you might not understand what I'm about to tell you, and it's because we haven't looked at all the different types of alpha subunits for heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, the alpha subunits that are going to get emeristylated aren't actually relevant to our pathway, but I am going to talk about all the different heterotrimeric G proteins just for a complete picture anyway. So I might as well mention which family of alpha subunits is going to have uh, meristic acid molecules stuck onto their uh, glycine residues in their first amino acid position. Okay, so it's all the alpha subunits that are within a family of alpha subunits known as the G-alpha-I slash naught family. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry, we're about to discuss that. Okay, so we will come to this if you don't know what that means. There are eight alpha subunits in this family. Okay, right, and those family members will have a glycine at position one, and that glycine can get uh, n meristoylated in this way. So the name, again, that I hope you agree makes sense, because the process of adding a meristoyl group onto something is called meristoylation. We've added it onto uh, the nitrogen of the amino uh, group, okay, so we have n meristoylated our uh, alpha subunit. Okay, so the alpha subunits within this family not only get a palmitoyl group added onto some cysteine residue within them, but also uh, a myristoyl group added onto their amino terminal uh, glycine, basically. So they'll have definitely two acyl groups coming off. Okay, so you can either have one or two um, acyl group attached groups attached to you, and these will hold you at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Okay, so that was a little diversion, but I think it was a necessary diversion, because it's a very important thing to understand that these are attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. 
OK, right, so we've only done the alpha subunit so far. Heterotrimeric G proteins are trimeric, they have three subunits, so there are two more that we need to cover. OK, the beta and the gamma subunit. So let's put these here now. Basically, the beta and the gamma subunit are always going to remain together. They are bound together always. Okay, and for that reason, they're often called the beta-gamma complex. However, they are two separate polypeptides. It's just they never, ever come apart under any physiological circumstance, as far as we know. Okay, right. Uh, so... Basically, when the alpha subunit is in the off state, but not in the on state, the alpha subunits combine to a beta-gamma complex. So I'll show this like so. So here the alpha subunit is nicely associated with this complex of a beta subunit here and a gamma subunit here. Okay, so I have the beta subunit in blue here and I'll have the gamma subunit in green, I think. Okay, right, so the gamma subunit also has a lipid moiety attached to it, okay? So the gamma subunit is going to have a lipid moiety that also attaches it into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and therefore the beta-gamma complex is also held dangling down from the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Now, this lipid moiety is another different lipid moiety. It's not a palmitic acid molecule, and it's not a myristic acid molecule, okay? This is what is known as a geronyl-geronyl group. Okay, and I will just show you what that is over the page. Okay, again, it's going to be added on to cysteine residues, which are within the polypeptide of the gamma subunit. Now, note the beta subunit does not need a lipid moiety, because it always remains bound to the gamma subunit, which has a lipid moiety, so it necessarily remains attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer as well. Okay, so let's discuss geronyl geronyl groups then. Okay, so uh, the structure then of a geronyl geronyl group. So basically, you're going to attach these onto cysteine residues again, and they are a large, um, they're a large lipid moiety, okay, so they're very hydrophobic, so they will again interact nicely with the phospholipid hydrophobic tails in the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so let's draw a cysteine residue then. So here's the amino, uh, amino terminal. Okay, here is the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off, and here's the carboxylic acid group. Okay, so that's the core amino acid structure. Once again, we'll draw a cysteine residue here. Okay, now this time I'm not going to draw the hydrogen coming off the sulfur, because instead what you're going to have is this geronyl geronyl group coming off here. Okay, so I'm now going to go over to using skeletal formulae because if you don't use skeletal formulae, I don't think I'd be able to fit it on this line even. Okay, and it looks a total nightmare if you don't use skeletal formulae. So let me remind you of how skeletal formulae work. You don't show carbon atoms, they're implicitly shown by corners, and you don't show hydrogen atoms coming off carbons. Where carbons have got missing bonds, it's implicitly uh, understood that you understand that that means that hydrogens are coming off those. Okay, so here is our first carbon then. That corner is a carbon. Okay, then we have another carbon here, another carbon, and we're going to have a double bond nicely there. Okay, and we're also going to have a methyl group coming off here. Now we're going to repeat this same pattern again, okay, and we're going to repeat it four times. So let me do this for you so that before I join them together, because if I show you the repeating pattern, hopefully you'll find it easier to understand the full thing. Okay, so we're just going to repeat this structure four times, basically, like so. Okay, and this structure is actually known as the subunit of an isoprene polymer. This actually isn't isoprene, but this is how isoprene polymerizes together. So geronyl geronyl groups are actually uh, four isoprene molecules polymerized together. Okay, so, whoops. Um, so, we've got these four repeating units, and now all we need to do is connect them together like so. So that's how you can remember this structure. Okay, so this full thing now is called a geronyl-geronyl group. 
and it's attached onto the sulfur atom of our cysteine residue. Okay, now this link where you have a sulfur atom between two carbon atoms here, okay, this is known as a thioether link. Okay, again, it's drawing parallels with oxygen because when you have an oxygen between two carbons, like so, that's known as an ether link. Okay, so when we've got sulfur rather than carbon, we just stick the thio prefix on. Okay, and it's a thio ether link there. Right, so uh, onto a cysteine residue within the gamma subunit of our heterotrimeric G protein, you are going to add a geranile geranile group. That will implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and that will hold this gamma subunit at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. And because the gamma subunit is bound to the beta subunit, uh, the beta gamma complex, as it's called, will be held at the in the leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Now, when the alpha subunit is in the off state, it will associate with the beta gamma complex to form the full heterotrimeric G protein here. Now, we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video, what we're going to discuss is the diversity of heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so how many different heterotrimeric G proteins are there? We are going to discuss all the different alpha subunits, all the different beta subunits, and all the different gamma subunits. Okay, now this is the heavy bit, okay, but it's worth it. Once you've got this, then you won't be confused when you see things like G alpha O in some paper and you're thinking, what is that? Okay, we will paint a clear picture.